Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you tonight. And uh, thanks so much for joining us for this really important conversation. I am Janice Kamina Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc., I warmly welcome you to tonight's uh, America at a Crossroads virtual town hall program. Our judge leadership team, as you have, you've been watching every week, you know, former Congressman Mel Levine, David Lehrer, former LA County Supervisor Zevi Oslovsky, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chasen, and myself. And you saw our list of co-sponsors a moment ago on the screen. Thank you to all of you. Tonight, we are thrilled to host the brilliant legal team who prevailed in court against the Nazi defendants, uh, Robbie Kaplan, Karen Dunn, together with Integrity First for America's Executive Director, Amy Spitalnik, and conversation with UC Irvine Law Professor Henry Weinstein. We look forward to the conversation. With US, Russia, Ukraine being front and center in the news this month, next week's program couldn't be more timely. We'll welcome political activist and former world chess champion, Gary Kasparov, former US ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, and Washington Post, Max Boot, Join us for a real world game of chess and chicken, Russia, the United States, and Ukraine. Then on January 26th, we welcome the Atlantic's Ann Applebaum, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, journalist, commentator, and author, together with the outstanding political sociologist and author from Stanford, Larry Diamond, on the topic, Twilight of Democracy, the Seductive Lure of, of Authoritarianism. Full unedited recordings of all of our programs can be found on our YouTube channel and on our website. An easy to use link is provided in every single email that David or I send. Um, be sure to look at the activism section of our website. Our web website is www.jewsunitedfordemocracy.org for links to lots of organizations directly engaged in fighting for voting rights and for our democracy. There are many volunteer opportunities and lots of organizations doing great work if you have an organization to suggest that we include on our list, just email me and we vet them and then add them to the list if appropriate. Now, please welcome my amazing partner, David Lear, for a couple more programs he's going to announce and share with you. Thank you, Thank you Janice. Tonight promises to be a fascinating exploration of a legal case that has real world implications in the effort to counteract extremist groups and their leadership. In Watergate, the watchword was follow the money. Today, the critical phrase may be extract the money. Make the purveyors of hate pay a price for their sociopathic behavior. We'll learn about what a court of Virginia set in motion when it awarded to the clients of our guests more than $25 million in damages. On February 2nd, we're bringing back the CEO of the Anti Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, with KCRW's Madeline Brand. They will discuss his just published book, It Could Happen Here. The subtitle of the work tells us what we will be discussing why America is tipping from hate to the unthinkable and how we can stop it. And this week, we secured the Atlantic's Bart Gelman, author of the recent widely cited piece, Trump's Next Coup Has Already Begun. January 6th was practice. His subtitle is Donald Trump's GOP is much better positioned to subvert the next election. That will be on February 23rd, and the subject matter and direction of the discussion are obvious from the title of his piece. Our moderator tonight is Henry Weinstein, a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law for decades. He was the legal report for the Los Angeles Times, garnering part of two Pulitzer Prizes and the prestigious Columbia School of Journalism's John Chancellor Award. That award was given to him for his courage, integrity, curiosity, and intelligence, all of which will be on display tonight. Henry? Thank you very much, David. I think that actually the courage and the integrity is uh, what we should be talking about with the three fantastic women that I'm getting to interact with uh, tonight. Um, from left to right on my screen, we have uh, Amy Sp um, uh, Spitalnik, who is the Executive Director of Integrity for America, the organization that has been on the front lines of the uh, battle to keep democracy and fight extremism and underwrote um, this lawsuit. Um, next to, uh, to Amy are Roberta Kaplan and Karen Dunn, two of America's great lawyers. Some of you, I suspect, may have first heard about Roberta when she, in 2013, won the monumental case on behalf of Edie Windsor, um, which struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, uh, Roberta and Karen used to work in the same law firm together, um, or, or they worked at the same law firm, uh, Paul Weiss, at one time or another. Karen is now a partner at Paul Weiss. Roberta has her own law firm. Karen um, among other things, clerk for Supreme Court Justice uh, Stephen Breyer, 
and uh, also worked in the, in the, in the White House um, a, a couple of presidents ago, definitely not under the last president. And uh, I think we should just get right into it. Um, Amy, can you remind us to start out, what exactly happened in Charlottesville in August 2017? Well, thanks so much, Henry, and to the whole judge team for having us tonight. Um, it's so great to be back with everyone. Um, so it's easy to forget that four years ago in an American city, neo-Nazis and white supremacists were so emboldened, so empowered that they could attack that city and target people based on their race, religion, and willingness to defend the rights of others. But of course, that's precisely what happened. And as we now know, what happened four years ago in Charlottesville really became a harbinger of the cycle of extremism that's followed. First, on Friday night, to refresh everyone's memories, um, I think it's hard to forget those um, images of Nazis with tiki torches, specifically chosen to evoke the KKK and the original Nazis. They descended on the University of Virginia, chanting things like Jews will not replace us in blood and soil, and ultimately surrounded a small group of peaceful counter protesters at the, at the Thomas Jefferson statue on campus where they kicked, punched, beat them up, threw fuel and lit torches at them, including a number of our plaintiffs who were there that evening. And of course, the next day, everyone knows the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured so many others, but it was truly a day and a weekend of violence, um, including um, the fact that it was a Saturday, a Shabbat, and the local synagogue was surrounded by Nazis with semi-automatic weapons talking in their online chats about, quote, torching those Jewish monsters, chanting things like Sieg Heil. The violence continued throughout the day. A line of interfaith clergy, including one of our plaintiffs, was charged by these extremists with people attacked. And of course, the day culminated in the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured so many of our plaintiffs who were there um, and suffered extensive injuries, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And of course, the basis of this case and what's so important to understand is that nothing that happened that weekend was an accident. Rather, it was planned meticulously in advance. And as Robbie and Karen and our team laid out um, in excruciating detail over the four weeks of this trial, um, the defendants intended for there to be violence. And violence is, of course, what happened. So Robbie, why don't you tell us a bit about the underlying claims in the case that's called Signs versus Kessler uh, that, that emerged out of the uh, events of August of 2017. And uh, please remember to unmute yourself. Um, so, you know, most of the claims or many of the claims in the case were kind of what you would expect in cases like this, uh, claims based on the underlying torts, the assaults, the things like that that happened. Um, the most innovative claim and a claim that I wasn't aware of then, and unfortunately I'm all too aware of now, is the claim we brought under the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Um, why is that so important? Let me just flash forward. It's so important because many of the cases that are being brought civilly against uh, Donald Trump and others, uh, really the foot soldiers of Donald Trump who attacked the Capitol on January 6th have also been brought under the KKK Act. When we brought our case four years ago though, I, I think it's fair to say that the KKK Act of 1871 was a, uh, a, free, a very infrequently used statute um, a, a statute that was used even less frequently with success. Um, it was, it's exactly what it says it is. It was a statute passed by the Reconstructionist Congress to authorize implementation, believe it or not, of the 13th Amendment, the Amendment Prohibiting Slavery. Um, and it was intended to do exactly what it says, what I just said, which is to try to stem the tide of the re-enslavement or the effectual, effective re-enslavement of the newly freed slaves in the Jim Crow South. Um, as a result, it, and unlike most us other civil rights statutes, it actually pertains to private conduct. Most civil rights statutes only pertain to conduct by the government, but the KKK Act actually prohibits conspiracies uh, to commit racially motivated violence. And again, what they had in mind was trying to stop the Klan. Um, it's been used in our country it was used in this period in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, it was used successfully in the 1920s when there were terrible race riots. And the most, the, the last successful kind of era in which the KKK Act was used was not surprisingly the civil rights era. Uh, one or two of the freedom riders who were killed 
um, going down south, their parents brought successful KKK Act cases. So that's a statute we did. Um, there was clearly, in my mind then, and even more so today, something ironic about having to use a statute that was needed in Reconstruction in the United States of America in 2021, 2022. Uh, but those, the circumstances in Charlottesville, and I would argue circumstances that continued since Charlottesville required it. Thank you, Robbie. Karen, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the case. A um, couple of things. One, tell, a, tell the audience a bit about who the plaintiffs, who your plaintiffs were, who the defendants are, and what you see as the significance of, of winning a $26 million verdict against the defendants. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having us very much. We really appreciate it. Um, so the plaintiffs were uh, people who were living in Charlottesville at the time and for one reason or another um, found themselves peacefully protesting the events of August 11th and 12th. Um, as Amy said, August 11th was the torch march um, that went through campus uh, up the lawn at UVA and to the Thomas Jefferson statue. There were about 25 uh, peaceful counter protesters, most of them students. Um, two, those, that small group was surrounded by 500 people wielding tiki torches and lighter fluid. Um, two of those people were our plaintiffs. Um, the following day uh, was obviously the car attack, but also an incredible amount of other violence in the streets of Charlottesville. Um, seven of our plaintiffs were injured in that car attack. Um, some, you know, you would recognize from iconic photos from that day, they were severely injured. Um, our lead off witness was one of the plaintiffs who first generation in her family to go to college, Colombian American, a very young woman, like 100 pounds soaking wet, extremely compelling witness who had been attacked Friday night, verbally and physically at the Thomas Jefferson statue, and then unbelievably also hit by the car the next day, shattering her skull, uh, concussion. To this day, uh, you know, can't really read that well because of light and other sensitivities, very difficult. Um, you know, probably not a dry eye in the courtroom when she testified. Um, those were our plaintiffs, very compelling people from all different backgrounds. The defendants in the case, and this is very important, um, were both the most violent members of the conspiracy. So for example, James Alex Fields, who drove the car in the car attack, but also the leaders of the white supremacist movement who had organized the events of that weekend and planned for the violence. And it was very important that we uh, bring suit, not just against the foot soldiers, but really against the leadership of the movement, both the individuals and the groups. And so some of the most well-known of our defendants include Richard Spencer. He was the head of the alt-right. He really in invented the term alt-right. Um, he was a defendant, by the way, who represented himself pro se, which we'll talk about. Um, Christopher Cantwell, otherwise known as the crying Nazi, has a um, 20,000 followers on his podcast, Radical Agenda, very violent individual, also one of our defendants who represented himself. And Jason Kessler was another organizer of the, uh, of the events, the key organizer who uh, was from Virginia. Um, and then there were many others who were leaders of the neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement. Um, your question about what is the impact of a verdict like this, I think probably we could talk about it for a long time, so I'll just give the highlights. Um, one key thing about this verdict is that we got a finding of liability as to each and every defendant as part of the conspiracy. And so this case, as we'll discuss, has become um, a model for others um, how to use the KKK Act and conspiracy law to establish liability for planned violence um, of this nature. And so that was a very important finding. And then the damages finding, which was compensatory and punitive damages, um, was very thoughtfully considered by the jury. The numbers that they came out with were specific and they were meticulous. And the point of punitive damages under the law is to send a message, not just to the defendants in the case, but to all people and to all potential people who would consider doing the same acts. And so we very much view this as a message sending verdict, which we had hoped that it would be, and it truly was at the end of the day, um, that tells people 
this is not okay under the law, and this is what can happen to you um, in the form of civil liability and financial, uh, you know, tying you up financially for the rest of your life. So a lawsuit like this can be both punitive and preventive going forward, right? Exactly. That's well, very well put. I'd, I'd also like to ask either or both of you to talk about a little bit about um, what it was like for your clients, the plaintiffs, to have to relive what were must have been the worst moments of their lives. She's let me set the stage for that now that I've unmuted myself. It, let me give people listening kind of the context because it's, it's very important here. So we were in a courtroom in Charlottesville under COVID conditions for over four weeks. What that meant is the only people who were allowed, the entire courtroom actually, the entire courthouse was shut down to any other business. We were the only case in which activity was happening in that courthouse for those four weeks. Um, in the courtroom every day, in a windowless courtroom every day, were the following people and the following people only. One reporter, and they, they kind of rotated, who got to sit in the corner. Um, the jury of 12 who sat really where the audience would sit in the jury because they were spread out for COVID conditions. Um, the judge and his staff, our legal team, and then anywhere from six to 12 lawyers and parties on the other side. And as Karen already mentioned, two of those parties every single day were two of the key defendants in the case, Chris Cantwell, who was incarcerated. He's in federal prison right now. He was convicted for threatening to rape the wife of another white supremacist. So he's serving a federal prison sentence. But the marshals brought him in every day and he, was, he had his handcuffs taken off and he was wearing street clothes. And the, uh, Richard Spencer, who as Karen noted, was at that time uh, was widely thought to be and certainly considered himself to be the leader of the alt-right. Um, so that was intense. I, I'm not sure, I'm kind of an intense person to begin with, but I don't think in my entire life I have experienced a more intense environment. Everyone was masked, the jurors and everyone else. So actually for us, it was made it a little bit hard because we couldn't really read what the jurors were thinking. Um, and day in and day out, um, we and the jury uh, would not only hear the lawyers of some of these defendants, a couple of whom could get pretty outrageous, but two of the defendants themselves who really felt themselves to be, especially Cantwell, completely unconstrained by any rules of decorum, of civility, of anything that you would remotely consider to be appropriate conduct and behavior in a courtroom. So it started even before we had a jury uh, one of the lawyers, Josh Smith, for several of the defendants, who is from Jewish background, uh, stood up one of the very first conferences in the case and said he wanted to prevent us from using the word the Holocaust because he, as a Jew, is very sick of Jews who go on and on and on about the Holocaust. And he didn't think that we had any right to use that term. Um, holding myself in, and I have to tell you, it was not easy. I waited until he finished and I stood up and said, Judge, we don't need to use the word Holocaust. We could just use the words that defendants used. And their words were, let's gas the kikes, let's oven the kikes, let's genocide the kikes. I said, they said these things over and over. So we don't need to use our words. We're going to use their words to talk about what they had in mind. And what became truly unusual uh, at this trial and truly intense is that words like kike became part of everyday normal discourse in that courtroom. Uh, and, and, the, and Josh Smith, the same lawyer, said later that he meant to desensitize. It was on purpose. They wanted to desensitize people to these beliefs. To some extent, they succeeded because you would just hear it and you would think, oh, well, there's just another reference to kike. Uh, to some extent, they failed because they got verdicts of over $25 million. Um, but it was truly uh, one of the more intense experiences to watch, particularly the African-American jurors, hear 
and look at some of the documents that these defendants put together that one of them was something called a nigatote, which is supposed to be a piece of luggage that you made out of metal that you use to carry around your, you can fill in the words. Um, uh, it was extraordinary. And so for the, so that's just the backdrop. So imagine Natalie Romero, who as Karen said, I'm not even sure she's 95 pounds wet. Uh, and another undergrad, an African-American young man, Devin Willis, who, who were subjected together to what must have been nine hours of cross-examination by the people who assaulted them that Friday night and then that Saturday. To this day, I will never not fully understand how they did it. And, and when we prepared them or we tried to prepare them to do it, I know the word that I kept using was dignity to Devin. I said, just make sure that you show them your dignity. And, and I have to tell you, it's one of the more impressive things I've ever seen in my entire life. Both of them and all the other plaintiffs surely did. Karen, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, so one thing you'll notice is that Ravi and I spent so much time together, we just finished each other's sentences. Um, so I, you know, echo everything that Ravi said. Um, the one thing, thing I wanna pick up on that, that I think is worth stressing, other than the extreme bravery and inner strength of all of our plaintiffs, um, they're the true courageous ones, not us, um, is this tactic of desensitization because it didn't just happen in our trial. I mean, our trial was really a microcosm of something that's been going on and is going on in the broader world. But it was very obvious to us what was going on in this case, which is a, a very deliberate strategy to desensitize the jury and to desensitize us. And it's true, after you live for four weeks in what I came to think about as a bubble of hate and violence, you start to feel yourself just becoming numb to it. And no matter how passionate you are about these issues, you feel that. And that was probably true of the entire trial team. Certainly, um, you know, I, I would hear myself saying these words in cross-examinations and, you know, we had to say them when we addressed the jury. And you're, the first time it's so shocking, but then by your time you're on time 50 of the same words and the same evidence, it's not as shocking. Um, and so we began to understand this is what they were doing on purpose. So one good example of this is Richard Spencer who presents um, in an inc incredibly uh, nice way. He's a smooth talking person. He uses lofty rhetoric, he's well-educated, he's well-dressed. Um, one of the best pieces of evidence against Richard Spencer was this entirely unhinged rant that he delivers on Friday night, um, or excuse me, on Saturday after the car attack when things have you know gone off the rails and he's extremely frustrated. And it is extremely racist. He says the most horrible, unimaginable things um, to some of the other defendants and co-conspirators. And it's on, on audio and they all kind of hate each other. So after this, so this gets released into the public. So we have this rant. We play it in opening. We play it in our cross-examination of Richard Spencer. And then Richard Spencer, when he gets to present his own case, pro se, he plays it again. And so when I talked to the jury in closing, I said to them, why do you think he played this again? Did he think you hadn't heard it enough? He wanted to make sure you really heard what he had to say? No, this is deliberate and he's trying to make it so it's not shocking and it doesn't seem as terrible. But that is his true character revealed. And as Robbie said, when, when we addressed the jury, we had to you know, put the lie to this and, and pull back the curtain and show what was going on and we said to them, don't let this happen to you when you deliberate. Um, and it was very shocking to hear them admit this, to this strategy afterwards. It was shocking they were doing it. It was shocking that they admitted it. And the reason we stress this is because this is happening more broadly um, today than it ever has been before. Um, and what our case showed was that, that this is not just speech, this is about violence. Our case fundamentally was about violence. And so we drew the connection between 
the racial motivation of the violence and the organizational communications of the defendants in this case. But just, we want everybody to be aware that this is, this is really deliberate. This is a, not an accident, as Amy said. Thank you. I, I, think, I think the language issue here is, is very important in part because you all were, were in the courtroom and you heard this as did the jury, but there are a lot of people on the outside who wouldn't have heard this, but for the fact that you did it. And, and it isn't important to let the public know just how base, how vile these people are, because there's a lot of people that wanna say, oh, things aren't that bad, right? I, I think you're muted. Of how vile they are? Yeah. Deborah Lipstadt, the foremost Holocaust historian in the world, who hopefully will soon be confirmed as the ambassador for anti-Semitism at the State Department, she testified until the judge cut her off, but she testified that she was shocked. She was shocked by the degree of overt Nazi symbolism, overt anti-Semitism, and echoes of the 1930s in Germany in this case in, this, in the United States among these guys. So if you can shock Deborah Lipstadt, you ha it has to be pretty shocking. Well, and some, of, some, of, some of the defendants extolled Mein Kampf, right? Yeah, it was his really favorite book. D mein Kampf came up, what, Karen? A dozen and a half times? It, they talked about Dein Kampf, Mein Kampf the way we would talk about reading the New York Times. My favorite part was one of, one of the guys said, <laughs> my favorite part, said that we were kind of pushing him on Mein Kampf and he said, yeah, you know, I like Mein Kampf, but I really like it for the social policies. So my able colleague, Michael Block on cross-examination said, you mean you don't like the Jew killing part? It's just, it's just the social policies in Mein Kampf. But, but that's how crazy it got. I mean, it, it really. Yeah. We had one defendant who said that um, he, he very much modeled himself after Hitler. And uh, he said, he, he wrote his own manifesto. Um, and in it, he said that when his newborn son was, was born and opened his eyes, his first thought, this man was about Adolf Hitler. Well, and if I, had I don't know what else to say. I mean, it was extraordinary. Well, and I think that's why this trial was so important because what our team did was put this all on the record at a moment when the far right is trying to whitewash history, to rewrite history and say, that we were just joking when it came to these, to these plans for Charlottesville. This was, of course, not a violent attack. This wasn't a violent conspiracy. This puts on the record in, a, in really a stunning way how vile, how meticulously planned it all was. And actually, tomorrow, we are going to be posting all of the trial transcripts on IFA's website so that people can go back and actually have this as a resource so that the full story of Unite the Right that Robbie, Karen, and our plaintiffs and team laid out at trial is there for the world to really understand because it's so important that we not let these extremists rewrite what happened. So you all were shocked by the degree of which they were so open about um, their loathing of Jews. And it wasn't just Jews, obviously, they're very anti-immigrant anti-black, um, it's, 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 it's sort of a movement of othering among other things. Besides that, was there anything else in this trial that, that happened that particularly surprised or shocked you um, beyond that? I think what was most shocking to me is the fact, is kind of the opposite, the fact that we kind of got used to it as we've been discussing. Um, it became like ordinary working day <laughs> to have to talk about these things and to have particularly Cantwell just do and say the most vile, threatening things. Now, look, looking back, I think the judge allowed that to happen because they were pro se and because he didn't want to give him any arguments on appeal. And I understand that. Um, but, you know, Cantwell would write motions saying, you have to exclude this document, judge, because it was written by a Jew and therefore is untrustworthy. I mean, it was, it was like living in Alice in Wonderland, kind of evil Nazi Alice in Wonderland world. Um, in the degree or 1933. Right. And, and exactly, I guess. And the degree to which I got used to that, you know, um, was, was shocking to me. The last night um, after the closings, we all went out for beers off our team. And finally, after like this immense buildup of pressure, 
people started telling jokes about the trial and kind of imitating various people in the case. And I don't think I've ever laughed so hard in my life. It was like this enormous spout of relief uh, went off, but that's what we needed to do again, because it had been built, the tension had been building for so long at such a high pressure. You, you mentioned the judge not wanting to give uh, Spencer or anyone else or can't well any grounds for appeal. Are they, have, are they appealing? Have they said what their intentions are? With respect uh, to appeals, no, go ahead, Karen, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. With respect to appeals, no, although I assume, I have to assume they will appeal. Um, there are post-trial motions they're going to be filing. One of them's already been filed, seeking to reduce the damages numbers, saying that with respect to certain defendants, there was insufficient evidence. Uh, kind of most of, it, it's pretty typical to file these kinds of motions in a, at post-trial, so we'll be dealing with those next month. Uh, speaking of, of of the defendants and, and, and the damages, um, we've had several questions already come in from the audience asking about whether or not these people or any of these entities have assets that can be that can be grabbed um, post trial. Robbie loves to answer this question, so I'll, I will yeah. defer to her. So the, so the answer is we don't know yet. Um, we think that some of them do. Cantwell's podcast, for example, with its twenty thousand followers actually, I think, is a profitable enterprise. Um, Richard Spencer has certainly, his family has assets. Um, League of the South, one of the organizational defendants, has, I think, 16 chapters throughout the South. They certainly have money. Um, but the great thing about getting judgments like this is something I learned as a very young lawyer, is what you get now is discovery about their assets. We haven't gotten that yet. Uh, we intend to fully pursue that uh, and once we know to use every remedy at our disposal, including garnishing their wages, putting liens on their houses, whatever it takes uh, to make sure that we collect every single possible penny we can for our clients. I know one of the defendants said that you had certainly derailed uh, his plans to erect another building for a headquarters in, Al in Alabama. And I suppose some of them may also have physical assets that you could get and then sell like office buildings or things like that, right? I mean, that's- yeah. the plan. Yeah, and I think the other the, the other point to make that um, that's important to recognize is the four years that we spent in litigation was very bad for these guys, uh, or so they say. Um, you know, Charlottesville that we think of as Charlottesville was really called Charlottesville 2.0, and there had been an event called Charlottesville 1.0, and they very much intended for there to be Charlottesville 3.0, and on and on. And they were unable to execute on Charlottesville 3.0. And they were unable to have subsequent events that were modeled on Charlottesville 2.0 or what they also referred to as the Battle of Charlottesville. Um, and our, um, our colleagues, as uh, Robbie mentioned, her colleague, Mike Block and my partner, Jessica Phillips, did an extraordinary job securing sanctions against uh, many of the defendants before trial um, including jail time, including financial penalties, and including having the judge make findings before trial against certain defendants, including that two of them were part of a conspiracy to commit racially motivated violence. That is an amazing thing in a civil case. Uh, you do not usually see that. Um, and so, you know, it's not just the verdict that's damaging here. It is the specter of litigation and the fact of litigation that has, these guys have lived with this, you know, since basically since they did this. So for years at this point. So one member of the audience asks, did anyone in the trial, presumably um, on the other side of this case, uh, mention the, the, the former president's comment that there were good people on both sides in Charlottesville? Did, did any of yeah. them say anything about that? Yeah, so um, the judge was good at excluding this evidence because it's it's obviously inadmissible evidence. It doesn't speak to whether the events at issue happened. Um, and there was a, a moment in the trial where Richard Spencer tried uh, to invoke the former president's words and the judge shut him down. And then he kind of changed up the sentence to not say the former president's name, and but basically say the same thing and the judge shut him down. Um, you know, we worked really hard to keep politics out of this trial. In fact, in the opening statement, we told the jury, you know, for the plaintiffs, 
this is not a case about politics. We're not here to talk about politics. It's not about the merits of removing Confederate statues or not removing them. For us, this case was about a, a meticulous plan to commit racially motivated violence. And the heart of our case was really the evidence of the planning that had gone on for months in advance. Um, and you could trace the, you know, the chats and the emails and the texts planning the events to what actually happened, including discussions over chat boards about running over people with cars. So that was really the heart of our case. And I think one of the most interesting things actually, and what made this case possible is there was a leak um, from the Discord chat platform where a lot of this was planned. And this happened you know, very early on and enabled us to write a complaint that was informed by the facts of the defendant's own communications. Now, but for that leak, I don't know, and I'm sure Robbie would say the same, we don't know that this case could have gotten past a motion to dismiss because we wouldn't have been able to show the judge the evidentiary basis that the defendants had planned this very purposefully. Um, but because of this leak of all these communications, our complaint was over 100 pages long and included pictures and, and you know, very graphic communications. So that's the other thing is we, we had a trove of evidence from the beginning and then we got more. Nothing. I, I would only add that that audience member's question though was very appropriate because <laughs> as Karen noted, the defendants did everything they could to try to bring politics in. And at times they succeeded. One of, one of their favorites uh, was to ask all the plaintiffs um, if Thomas Jefferson, because the, where they were, they were encircling the Thomas Jefferson statute on Friday night, whether Thomas Jefferson was a white supremacist. Um, and they kept trying to kind of needle uh, our clients and others with these kinds of statements. During the trial itself, I kind of came up with my own new method of objecting, <laughs> where I would kind of just open my hands, look at the judge, and just repeat what they'd said. Um, they would talk about, the, I remember they had a question about the Canaanites, and I was like, judge, the Canaanites? Like, how are the Canaanites relevant to this case? But, but they did everything they could to try to bring it in. And I think we mostly successfully uh, managed to keep it out. Thank you. And you were talking about how um, the, the, uh, the judge had cut off Spencer's points. A um, number of questions from the audience have come in about what was it that prompted the judge to cut off the Holocaust scholar, Deborah Lipstadt? Oh, he, because he had this uh, ruling in the case that said other than the plaintiffs, no one could talk about their emotional reactions to things. Um, he didn't want the plaintiff's case to be bo bolstered by someone else saying how they had reacted emotionally to something. And so it, it's different for an expert. I mean, I could have fought with him about it. It didn't matter. Deborah's such a good witness and honestly it didn't matter. But I think he thought that her saying that she was shocked by the volume of Nazi imagery violated that ruling. Good. Could Several members of the audience would like to know a little bit more about the jury. Could you tell us about the composition of the jury and also whether you'd had any opportunity to talk to them post-trial? Um, so we have not spoken to the jurors post-trial. Um, the composition of the jury is very was very interesting. Um, you know, normally in a case, there are issues of race, or even if not normally, in many cases, there are issues of race that are kind of below the surface. But when you have a case that's about race, uh, and on the other side, you have white supremacists, the issue about race is not below the surface. It is the entire discussion uh, day in and day out of jury selection. And so we had three days of extremely tense jury selection. Um, there were uh, questionnaires issued in advance that asked people, how concerned are you about racism against Black people, Hispanics, Jews, and white people. Um, and people could check how the concern they were uh, about racism against these various groups. So we had a lot of information about the jurors when they walked in uh, for voir dire. Um, one of the things that happened very early on is uh, our side brought what's called a Batson challenge. And a Batson challenge is when the other side 
has, you believe, struck a potential juror um, based solely on issue of race, that the juror was otherwise completely impartial, um, but the, the strike was, was based on race. And so uh, we brought a Batson challenge. Uh, there are some people who think you need to wait for a pattern uh, of such strikes, but you don't really, you can bring it on the first strike that you think is, uh, is impermissibly based on race because that's unconstitutional. Karen um, does and what not believe in waiting in these circumstances. I, yeah, I do. I'm Quite not right. the most patient. Um, <laughs> and turned out uh, it was a good decision because the judge uh, did not resolve the Batson challenge right away. Uh, and instead it kind of hung out there over the entirety of the rest of jury selection. And so um, it really cabined the defendants who I think otherwise would have tried to strike every uh, minority juror um, and every Jewish juror. We didn't see any Jewish jurors, but we ended up with a jury, uh, I think that um, was, uh, had four black people, I think also four women um, and uh, the rest uh, white men, I think. Maybe Robbie or Amy remembers better, but that, but I do think that that was a pretty pivotal um, event in the jury selection that probably changed the tenor of, of the thing. Right. right. It was a much better jury than I think we thought we were going to get when we saw the huge pool that came in. And as Karen said, I think that was largely due to her Batson challenge. Amy, I want to direct a question uh, to you. You and your organization have been very public about this case. You've been very out front. You've been speaking in a lot of places. You put a lot of material up on the internet. Have you or any, or your organization or, or any of the lawyers been subject to any retaliatory acts either before, during, or after the trial? Yeah. Well, also to, to clarify, Integrity First for America, th this case has actually been our entire focus for the last four years. Um, it, we think it's too important and I think as we've seen in the last four years, what happened at Unite, the right really previewed so much that's followed. And as has been alluded to tonight, this case was certainly important in and of itself to hold those responsible accountable. But as we've now seen, particularly with these January 6 cases that have emerged in recent months, um, this case has become a model for how you do this, how you do this well, um, how you hold these extremists accountable, particularly at a moment when accountability is in short supply. Um, and so that is why this case has been really the central focus of our work for the last few years. And I will say the legal work has largely been pro bono in this case. One of the reasons an, an organization like IFA needed to exist to support this case is because of the security concerns that you raised. By far, our biggest expense was security. Threats directed at Robbie, Karen, me, our plaintiffs, our le legal team, simply because those who traffic in extremism, use threats and intimidation as a tool to try to avoid accountability. Sometimes it was the defendants themselves. Other times it was extremists looking on, supporting those defendants through um, intimidation, harassment, or in some cases, very explicit threats. And so that required significant security, not just in trial, um, while we were physically in Charlottesville for those you know, four plus weeks of trial, plus the time we were there around it, as well as of course, monitoring the dark web, keeping an eye on the threats and harassment that um, has been going on for years now. And so it's, it's, it's sadly why in litigation like this, it needs to be well-resourced um, and why um, it's so important that we start to see, for example, entities like the DC Attorney General bring cases like this because they are structured and built precisely to do this and have the infrastructure in place to handle not just the litigation, but also all of the peripheral concerns that come with it, security by far being the biggest. And he's and he has been very public about saying, about giving this, your endeavor a great deal of credit and saying that he was gonna pick all of your brains for, uh, for ideas. So he's certainly given you a lot of credit. So I take it, Amy, that you, um, for some time, you have felt that you see a, a line from Charlottesville to January the 6th. I think all of us do. I think the three of us actually wrote an op-ed after January 6th that said exactly that. Um, and while when Unite the Right happened, it was hard to know how much of a preview it would be, certainly the cycle of white supremacist violence, Pittsburgh, Poway, El Paso, the record level hate crimes we're seeing in this country. And of course, January 6th, which followed so many 
of the tools and tactics that we saw in Charlottesville, um, from the use of social media to plan the violence, to the use of quote unquote free speech tools to attack people violently, to the immediate finger pointing to Antifa and other red herrings to try to distract. And of course, now as we're seeing with the lawsuits that have come out, the fact that there um, are these tools that we can use to hold those responsible accountable. And so it's easy to feel powerless in moments like this. We are facing record levels of extremism. The Department of Homeland Security under Donald Trump called white supremacy the most pervasive and lethal threat in this country. Um, and there's no discounting how serious that threat is. And we're also seeing it become an increasingly normalized threat when you have replacement theory, um, anti-Semitic white supremacist theories giving, given a home on primetime television during shows like Tucker Carlson. Um, and elected officials giving them a mouthpiece and public health officials, election officials um, being targeted um, on the local level is the level of normalization that we have not really seen in this country when it comes to extremism for some time, but that's where we're at. And that's why it makes holding those responsible um, accountable all the more important. And so this case has really emerged not just as a way to do that as it relates to Unite the Right, as we've been talking about, but really a pathway and a model to do that moving forward. And that's been for me, you know, after the verdict, the most heartening part of this work. I wanna ask you another language question, probably provocative. Do you see a connection between the phrases, you will not replace us and stop the steal? A hundred percent. I think we actually wrote as much in that in that op-ed um, a year ago, and sadly, it's only become uh, more clear in that stop the steal is just a normalized paraphrase of you will not replace us. It's about this idea that the country is being stolen from the white Christian men that many on the far right believe should be running the show. And so when you hear conspiracy theories about immigrants and refugees and others undermining the election and influx of democratic voters, all of these conspiracies, they tie back to this very same idea of Jews will not replace us. And it's important that we understand that just because it might not be as obvious as Nazis with torches marching in Charlottesville, it is equally dangerous in many ways as it becomes increasingly normalized. Right. So another member of the audience would like to know, have any of the defendants in your case expressed any remorse about what happened? <laughs> to Heather so, Heyer? I mean, the, the general answer is no. The, 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 the clear answer to that question is no. However, they were at trial and they knew what the jury, they, they too saw the jury's eyes at least in the courtroom. And they knew that there were things they needed to say to make them, how shall we put it, more palatable uh, to the jury, maybe even to get some of the jury's sympathy. So I think all of them, care to correct me if I'm wrong, all of them uh, as a group expressed uh, regret for Heather Heyer. Of course, they would say they had nothing to do with James Fields. That was just complete coincidence that he happened to be there wearing their uniform, marching with them, and then doing what they'd all been talking about for weeks, which is driving into protesters. But they also, they felt bad for that. They even, I think one of the things that we laughed about drinking beer that night is, is Richard Spencer in particular expressed some sympathy for Natalie Romero. Um, no one else <laughs> among the plaintiffs, but Natalie Romero, who again is this very teeny, uh, uh, amazing young woman, um, he said he felt sorry for them. And I think one or two of them also said that. Uh, but for the most part, no, because they believe that they one they believe two things. One, that James Field was, I mean, right after the events, they all praised James Field and glorified him and said it was terrific. And they sent him Christmas cards to prison and money and et cetera. But at trial, they said that they, you know, that he was complete coincidence. He did what he did and they were sorry for the loss to the people that he killed and the people he injured. And the other thing is, especially with respect to Friday night and it, it, it going into Saturday, their view was they were, it was all self-defense. They weren't looking to hurt or kill Jews, black people or other minorities. No, 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 no. This whole thing was about their need to defend themselves from Antifa. Sound familiar? Um, so in their view at trial, everything they did 
was to defend themselves appropriately from these incredibly dangerous groups of Antifa who, who they claim were in Charlottesville and who were truly were causing all the problem. And Chris Cantwell in particular was obsessed with this theory. Um, and we watched the same videotape, I don't know, Karen, five dozen times over and over in slow motion and fast motion, rewinded, forward winded, so that uh, Chris Cantwell could show, for example, that anyone wearing a red bandana <laughs> on the streets of Charlottesville that day was a dangerous Antifa operative. That, that was his theory. So mostly no, a teensy bit of yes. The, this trial was not filmed live in, in the courtroom, was it? No, so uh, no cameras in federal court. Right, no, no, that's, I just wanted, I just want to make sure because several people have asked about that, but also yeah. you have a lot of external footage. It seems like this, that this event or series of events would make a, an incredible documentary. Has, has anybody approached you about doing that? If, if, if you're at liberty to say. I, there are people working on it. I, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say who they are, but there are people who are working on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's the only time I will say, it's the only time uh, and the only trial I've ever felt sad that there was not um, cameras in the courtroom in federal court because um, you know part of the significance of this case is to reveal what what really happened here. Um, you know, it, the question that you asked about was there regret. I mean, it's very hard to express regret when there was such um, extraordinary evidence of the purposefulness um, and the intent to plan very specific violence. Um, and so I, I was sorry that people could not see in real time um, on their television where they would really see it, um, the evidence of the planning, the intentionality um, to cause this violence on the streets of Charlottesville. Um, it's also hard for us to overstate how entirely committed our defendants in particular are uh, to this worldview. Um, they believe that uh, North America should be a white ethno state where uh, most of us would not be allowed. Um, we could visit as aliens, but we could not be citizens. We would not have the I rights. I don't think you or I could visit, Karen. Well, we, we, Bobby and I definitely, and Amy, we're out. We, yeah. we can probably not even visit. But this is, it's, it's a very strongly held worldview that's you know written down and very well developed. And for our defendants, I would say you know all of them, um, very strongly held belief system around these ideas. You know, it's funny that you said I had a friend over this weekend who I hadn't seen in person since COVID started, who's a very uh, successful Broadway producer, and we were talking about the case, and he said, you know, he's right. He said it would make an excellent play. Because having us all stuck in this courtroom, like I described it, four weeks, day in and day out, it was a very dramatic situation. Maybe too dramatic in some respects, but definitely very dramatic. So I want to turn back to Amy for a second. You, the, the case has already had a has already had a significant impact, both in the immediate thing and, and influencing other people to do things. But a number of people in the audience like to know what else, what other thoughts do you have about how people should should be, you know, uh, two things, magnifying the verdict and also just uh, what, you know, you talked about how a lot of people feel hopeless. So what, what else can people do about, uh, um, you know, fighting hate, fighting white supremacy? Well, look, I think as, as we've been discussing tonight and I hope is very clear to folks, accountability matters. Cases like this have major impacts, not just on those responsible, but in terms of the broader dynamics. And even before trial, we had defendants like Richard Spencer talk about how this case has financially devastated him, has made it harder for him to go about his business, has been alluded to defendants say how this has directly impacted their operations. And as I think Karen mentioned, precluded some people from participating what they would have called Charlottesville 3.0, which ultimately was a bust. And so seeing the impacts of accountability, even before trial, even before these multi-million dollar judgments, is incredibly powerful. And that's important, not just for the two dozen defendants named in this lawsuit, but for the deterrent effect this can have on others. And I also think that there are so many other, perhaps less tangible impacts of this case that really illustrate where we go in the fight 
for extremism. I fight against extremism. I already talked about how this case put on record everything that happened at Unite the Right in a way that no other effort has done thus far, and that's important. Um, but also it really exposed through testimony by Deborah Lipstadt, Pete Simi, who wrote that excellent report in conjunction with Kathy Blee, the tools, the tactics that these extremists use um, in a way that very few legal efforts have done thus far. And to expose not just the jury, but everyone following this, reporters and the world to these details of how white supremacists and extremists operate is really important at a time when, of course, we are seeing record levels of extremism. And so now with this case becoming a model, we know that accountability matters and we should be supporting it however we can. Civil litigation works. It's not a silver bullet. There's so much more that needs to happen in the fight against extremism. Of course, we've seen criminal prosecutions coming out of the government, particularly DOJ as it relates to January 6th. We need our state and local officials prosecuting hate crimes effectively, and we need to hold their feet to the fire on that at a time when hate crimes have hit record levels, not just against the Jewish community, but of course the Asian community and so many others. We need social media companies to live up to their ethical obligations. And we need to think more broadly about sort of a whole of society approach to combating extremism so that we're preventing the radicalization in the first place, developing resiliency strategies to protect our democracy so that people aren't going down that rabbit hole of discord or Reddit or whatever it is in the first place. And I want to give a particular shout out to Cynthia Miller Idris, who had a fantastic op-ed in the Times on the subject last week around January 6th. And so sort of to, to answer your question, I think there's a lot of reasons that folks will feel hopeless, as I mentioned, but there's a lot of reasons for hope right now. This case is one of them. The tailwinds of this case, the model it has created is another one of them. But I also think that there are so many more of us than there are of them, as daunting as it might feel in this moment. And so keeping our voices raised, holding our officials feet to the fire, making clear that we can't just sit idly by as people try to undermine our democracy. And this is really what this is. This is about our democracy in every way. And so keep ringing the alarm bells, keep raising your voices, certainly support efforts like this case, IFA, and the many other organizations doing important work in this space. These cases that are coming out in response to January 6th are really important as well. And I hope folks will continue to follow and support them however they can. But it can't stop there. And so whatever people can do when it comes to your, your voices as voters, as consumers, make sure that you are using them because so much is at stake and we are not powerless as daunting as it might feel. And people about are concerned about this well beyond the borders of the United States. One of the questions tonight came in from Sydney, Australia. So you can see the, uh, the potential power of this. Just like the thank you for that Amy, and also to ask uh, Robbie and Karen if you have any closing comments that you would like, like to make, because we're getting near the amount of our time we have. Um, the only thing I would say is, is just to echo what Amy said, which is that there, there is much reason to be hopeful. Um, as gratified as we were by this verdict, um, we were even more gratified by the response to the verdict. Um, we, we all received notes from people, uh, non-lawyers, um, from all across the country, not people we knew, um, who were very grateful uh, for this verdict and who said that they were inspired by it uh, to do more themselves. And just being in solidarity uh, with taking on the fight against violent extremism. So I, I think as horrible it is to listen to some of this stuff and to know that it happened, I think the, the twin messages of accountability um, and also community, that we are all in this together and that there's so many people across the country who care about this um, and are willing to, to put in their, their time and effort uh, to supporting this. I think I, I, I agree completely. I mean, I grew up as a kid um, going to Hebrew school in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1970s. And I remember I'd lie in bed at night and think to myself, God, you know, if I had lived in Germany, what would I have done? What I've had the guts to fight back, what I've become like Hannah Senesh, what I've known to do X or Y or Z. I, of course, those were all childish questions uh, that a, a young girl would think back then. Um, I'm not saying that we are anything like where things were in Germany, but I am saying that we have tools that the European Jews then did not have. 
We have a country with a court system. We have a country with a democratic system. Um, we have politicians. We have the press. And we need to use each and every one of those resources to fight back and to make sure that nothing like that happens in this country that was so good, has been so good to Jews in the diaspora, unlike any other country in the world. And that these guys remain, and they're mostly men, remain in the on the outskirts of society, and that we drive them back into their parents' basements playing video games rather than conspiring to commit violence on the streets of American cities. Well, I would like to thank you and to say that my, um, all of you said that my favorite message tonight came in from a member of the audience who said, I'm sure happy to have these three powerhouse ladies on our side. And I will certainly echo that sentiment. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and also to remind you that next week, um, Judge Jay and the community advocates are putting on another terrific program with uh, Gary Kasparov, Max Boot, and Michael McFall talking about the United States, Russia, and Ukraine. Good night, all. Take care.